here, this is the OpenGL talk with the long and complicated title, but, uh, well, many of the things won't be that much of a news to you if you have attended today's keynote, since Lars mentioned all of these things. And now I guess it's time to move a bit into the details. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, who I am. So I work for the Qt company, which of course was known as Digia, but now we are being split out. So now we are the Qt company. Well, I work a lot on Qt, mainly in the area of graphics. So OpenGL and all sorts of platform integration, windowing system related work. Uh, yeah, in the past I did all sorts of other things like touch support and whatnot. I have a focus on embedded, so embedded Linux, but uh, well, in theory, so in practice I do a lot of other things on other platforms, so desktop, mobile, and so on. And uh, before the cute company Digia, I worked at ARM, developing mobile GPUs and implementing OpenGL. And before that, I spent there are some years at Nokia doing UI frameworks on various mobile platforms. And originally I'm from Hungary. Currently I work in Oslo, Norway. So yeah, my accent might be a bit bizarre, but hopefully you will be able to follow. If not, we have lots of colorful pictures so in the slides, so you will be entertained anyway. So, Six wonderful classes, which is five anyway. So, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we really need to take a closer look at these. Besides this, there are many other new things in Qt 5.3 and 5.4, so there won't be time to look at everything, but well, maybe we'll have a few, few words at the end. So, first of all, Q Quick Widget. And to understand all these changes we have uh, done and started in Qt 5.3, I guess it's uh, good to take a look at, uh, at you know, how you have been doing OpenGL in Qt, starting with Qt 4. So the, co so the code snippet there, well, that's probably very familiar to uh, some of you. So this initialize GL, resize GL, pain GL, that's, that's kind of a well-known and familiar pattern. So what we see here, yeah, you know, how do you add your OpenGL scene to a widget-based UI? Well, by simply deriving from QGL widget and re-implementing a bunch of functions. You know, like in PaintGL, you do your, either your direct GL course, like GL draw arrays, whatever, or just use QPainter. So in Qt4, QPainter had like, at least two backends for OpenGL, one based on the fixed pipeline for OpenGL1, and then there was a shader based OpenGL2 paint engine. And so the result was often something like that. So yeah, that's an example from Qt4. Hello, GL. There's some OpenGL rendering there on the left. And then a bunch of widget slider sliders. Now, of course, the problem or the surprising thing uh, comes when you look at the, so what native windows does this application create in the windowing system? So on the right, we have the output from this Spy utility on windows, and uh, it might come as a surprise that you see five visible native windows. So the first five entries in that list are visible windows which is a bit, could be a bit unexpected since you probably expect one, since there's one window on the screen. So that's, yeah, that's because, as Lars already mentioned earlier today, so QGL widget always created its own native window, you know, and created the window surface and then, you know, did rendering in the usual way. The problem for us is that when, uh, this is a child widget, you know, it's combined with other elements, other widgets. 
then this doesn't really play nice with Qt. So Qt is not really in control of the content of that window. So for example, the fact that you can see that each and every slider, or C of them, become uh, native, that's already a workaround Qt is trying to do to ensure things like proper stacking. So imagine the case that you want to have overlapping widgets. So like if one of those sliders should overlap, like that OpenGL rendering, that only works correctly if you force that slider to be a native window. Otherwise, probably the QGL widget would go on top, which is not exactly what we want. So, and of course, this is a bit problematic for performance. So if you remember, Qt has migrated away from this model a long time ago. So we don't create native windows for each and every widget. That's not really ideal. And of course, on top of this, many of you are probably familiar with the different platform-specific glitches and uh, performance issues. So this type of applications, like that one, those are probably fine. But once you try to do some more uh, interesting things, like say, add two QGL widgets and put a splitter between them and try to resize them, then depending on the platform, you often got, you know, it may be resized slowly, maybe it did not repaint correctly, and so on and so on. And uh, to be honest, even though we tried, and still try, are still trying to address these issues that will never be a complete solution. So, yeah, this was the situation in Qt 4. And then came Qt 5.0, where the offering got, well, more advanced, much better, but this also means that there is, uh, it's a bit more complicated. So in addition to the QGL stuff, like QGL widget, we now have QWindow, so now it's possible to perform OpenGL rendering without using widgets, without you know, you know, using any of the uh, widget stack, which is, a, of course, much more lightweight and powerful way to do, like on the left. Well, there's this example with the not too up-to-date Qt logo, but the point is that there's just some custom OpenGL rendering. And on top of this, built on QWindow, you have Qt Quick 2. So on the right, two examples of typical Qt Quick applications. So on the top, something that has some, you know, completely custom UI, doesn't really look like a desktop application, full of fancy effects. And below it, a Qt Quick controls application, which is more suitable for desktop. But make no mistake, that's still all, that's an OpenGL window nonetheless. So this is all good. But of course, some of you probably wanted to have a bridge between these different worlds. And so Qt 5.1 started to, or tried, had an attempt to provide a solution which was this uh, create window container function. So on the left, you see a cute quick scene embedded into a widget UI. So those line edits on the top and bottom, those are regular Q widgets. And then you have the cute quick scene in the middle. And on the right, uh, that's like uh, some custom OpenGL rendering using QWindow, again, embedded or combined with widgets. So of course, this could be used as a poor man's replacement for QGL widget, but it still has the exact same issues, right? So still that black area with the triangle in the middle, that's still native. So it doesn't solve any of those issues I mentioned earlier. Uh, similarly, well, it has limitations. So like I said, QGL widget chose to turn things like other widgets into native. So with the window container approach, we decided that, okay, let's not do that. Instead, it has documented limitations, like uh, it's always an opaque box, so nothing can go on top. You can't put a Q-push button on top of that rendering there, like the triangle or the cute big scene, which is, again, not quite ideal. 
And so that's why in Qt 5.3, we have uh, this new concept based on redirecting the output of the Qt quick, Qt quick or in case of QOpenGL Digital, so it's the output of your OpenGL rendering. And instead, the widget stack will perform compositing for each window, which is nothing new. I mean, you are anyway probably running like some compositing window manager on your desktop or on mobile. Well, it's pretty sure that there is some similar concept in play. So, I mean, today this should be a you know, pretty easy and fine thing. So it's, uh, you know, it's 2014, so frame buffer, frame buffer object and things like that should just work. But on top of this, there was a very important motivation here. So the embedded and mobile angle. So first of all, for embedded, let's go back a bit. So on devices like embedded Linux-based devices, so think of Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black, any of the IMX6 SOC-based devices, you were probably running Qt on top of embedded Linux without a windowing system. So say using our EGLFS platform plugin, which is very nice, it's the easiest way to get you know, started to run something on top of the Linux frame buffer and EGL. But uh, it has limitations. So what it gives you is a full screen OpenGL window and one OpenGL window. So for example, trying to run this application on the right there, well, you, you would probably get the widget part shown, but once you click this create context button, when we try to add this, the window with the OpenGL, with the triangle, then your application will just abort since that platform does not support this. The same goes for our KMS platform plugin, which, you know, again, uses similar concepts. Or even today, like we have Wayland or Wayland platform plugin, an official part of Qt 5.4. But still, since it does not yet have support for subsurfaces, the result is that native child widgets are not really working correctly. So for example, this part here, this triangle, that will just show up as a standalone top-level window with, with the decorations and everything, which is probably not what you want. So really to provide a solution which can work identically across desktop, mobile, and embedded, that's another strong motivation here. And so the first in a row was QQuick widget in Qt 5.3. So, I guess it's time to do something live. So, this is an example we added in Qt 5.3.2. So this is really a comparison that you can switch between using a QQuick widget or the older method of uh, embedding a QQuick view using this create window container approach. So the two look identically in this simple case, right? Because it's you know, no overlapping widgets, no nothing, it's all fine. Let's change the text. But once we try to, for example, add something on top, so this is again some other widget on top, and it's semi-transparent to make it more exciting. Well, this of course does not look correct. This is the old approach. Because, you know, we, we don't do this. So this quick scene here is a native window. It goes on top of everything. However, once Qt is in control of the compositing, you know, this works just fine as expected. So, well, you get what you expect. So, well, that's pretty cool. And uh, what you have just seen, so, well, internally, it's not hard to guess what's happening. So, we simply take or render, like that quick scene, you know, get a texture out of it using frame buffer objects. And then these get drawn first. On top of that, we blend everything else. So, actually, those black pixels there, well, those are actually have an alpha of zero, so those are fully transparent, so you will see through the quick or open GL digits. 
And the result is that, you know, the thing just looks correct on all platforms, including embedded. So here, again, you know, same thing on the left and QOpenGL widget example from Q54 on the right. Quick widget from 5.3 running on a Sabre Lite board. So this is an IMX6 soft based board. And uh, you know, like on the left, you have two OpenGL widgets and it works just fine. It's there's no aborting of the application and no you know bizarre issues. It just runs properly at 60 FPS. Well, yeah, on the right, hmm, yeah, that's the same thing what we saw here. It's just an older version. It still has a beautiful rotating red rectangle, but I was told that's not appropriate, so it got removed. Anyway. Oh, yeah. And, of course, what about mobile? Of course, now you need to believe me, because you can't see this. But, you know, like you take an Android phone or tablet, and... Yeah, the thing is just there and works beautifully. Well, uh, you need to believe me or see it afterwards, but you know, same thing for mobile. It works the same way. Now, uh, again, a bit more into the details. So when Qt 5.3 came out, there were some, well, questions, or maybe it was some misconceptions and some confusion regarding traditional widget applications. So, of course, this will not change anything to those. So, if you are not using any of these widgets, then OpenGL is not a requirement. So, it's your widget application will work without OpenGL. That's, there's no change there. Of course, those of you who are interested in doing platform plugins and those kind of things, well, you need to probably, you know, just keep an eye on this. So, remember that uh, things got a bit complicated because from now on you can't say that this window will be software rendered and that window will be pure OpenGL because now we have a third type, you know, this, this composited type of windows which are like fully software based until you add a Q OpenGL widget or Q Quick widget into the widget hierarchy because then suddenly we need to turn uh, over and uh, switch to compositing. But that, that's done fully transparently to the applications. Similarly, multi-sampling. So, yes, that should just work. There's one exception, that if you have a, some old embedded or mobile device, which really has OpenGL ES2, and, you know, it's old, then, of course, there's a chance that you don't have the necessary extensions, and then you won't have multi-sampling. But for anything newer and on desktop, well, no, that should, that won't be an issue. So you can still, still can get multi something in your quick or, or your custom OpenGL and there you'll inside the key OpenGL widget. And finally, as you see on those screenshots there, well, while the most common cases for stacking are kind of solved, like you can easily have things on top of, on top of the OpenGL stuff, but uh, like seeing through to some other widget underneath, well, that's not so obvious due to the way the composition is done. So for that, we have a new widget attribute with always stack on top, which does exactly as the name suggests. It will move such OpenGL or quick widgets uh, into an extra third phase of the composition. So yeah, it will go on top of everything else which of course has some drawbacks because whatever you had on top, like this button here, will suddenly appear below, but you know, it's, you ask for always stack on top and that's what you get. Nevertheless, the point is that, yeah, you can, you know, implement like partially transparent or semi-transparent uh, QOpenGL digits so you can see whatever is underneath. So, yeah. And finally, regarding QQQ widget, well, you would now probably expect that we talk about the API or how it looks, 
but there's no need for that since it mirrors QQQ, so it's the exact same API. So, you know, if you have done QQQ applications in the past, then this will be very natural. The difference is that this is a Q widget, so just use it. Yes, and then that leads us to QQQ render control, which is uh, well, it's not really a departure from QuickWidget because this is a side effect of QuickWidget. Yes, demo time again. So, why is this great? You know, there's a queue window, custom OpenGL rendering, still doing a cube. That's not the point. When I click it, something happens in the queue quick scene. The point is that my cute quick scene is now going into a texture which I'm using in, you know, a, a random custom way. So, you know, particles, text, that's cute quick. And, uh, of course, this is what cute quick, cute quick which it does internally. So, no surprises. But this is uh, so useful and so interesting that while in 5.3 this was a private API, in 5.4 this is now public. And I know that some people has been, have been using this already in 5.3 because it's so cool. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's time to make this public. But the point here was really that there's no separate QQuick window on the screen. Instead, it got redirected. So we got a texture and then used it in our you know, OpenGL renderer. Of course, that could potentially be a non queued based OpenGL renderer. It doesn't matter what it is, because, you know, you just have an ordinary GL texture. And of course, it's all hardware accelerated, so it's not like, let's read back the content, like the pixels using GL pixels or something. No, this is, this is the real thing. Uh, of course, it was possible to achieve the same or similar things using tricks with shader effect, like a certain subtree, you could use a shader effect so that it goes through an FBO and you could dig out the texture from that. Well, conceptually, this is very similar, but there is no proper public way to do this, which is you know, kind of impressive, if you ask me. And, uh, so, of course, I now can't really tell that uh, what exactly is this useful for, but, you know, you just need to be creative because it opens up quite a lot of possibilities. If you think about the fact that a lot of people have been uh, integrating like game engines or whatever other scene graph, external scene graph systems into Qt using QGI widget or QWindow, this allows us to do the opposite so it's the Qt Quick gets integrated into the external application like a game engine or something. Of course, there can be issues, you know, with event loops and whatnot. But uh, still, the possibility is there. So, you know, get textures out of Quick and then use it in any way you want. The rest of the stuff doesn't need to be cute based Oh yeah, and of course the input, question of input, like how do you get mouse touch or keyboard into a scene if there's no window on the screen? Well, you know, send events to the quick window. You still have that, it's just hidden. So there's no mystery there. Yes, and now is the time when we can say that, yeah, quick and QML is done. It's, we are finished this for now, because in Qt 5.4, we finally have QOpenGL digit. So, why is this, you know, important? Because previously, like, you know, some of these, many of these old OpenGL helper classes starting with QGL, QGL frame buffer object, and so on, we had marked those as uh, obsolete, deprecated, yet QGL widget did not have a suitable replacement until now. 
So now in Qt 5.4, the entire Qt OpenGL mod module is done. It's obsolete. It's, it's, it will remain usable. But of course, if you are starting new development, then maybe it's not the best idea to rely on that. Instead, you just think of the word open. Open is great. So now instead of QGL, you are just writing QOpenGL. Uh, having said that, many of the things will be no, no news to you. So surprise, surprise, we will keep the familiar pattern of like initialized GL, resized GL, and GL. And yeah, it's like your GL widget. Just derive from it over reimplement some functions, and you know, that's that. It is possible to open a QPainter on it. Uh, so in Qt5, we only have the OpenGL2 paint engine. Obviously, nobody's going to bother with the old fixed pipeline, OpenGL1 paint engine. Uh, here, of course, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, this will probably not work with core profiles, which is interesting to those of you who are doing modern OpenGL you know, 3, 4, and using core profile contexts. So it remains to be seen what we do about that. Of course, when it comes to your direct GL calls, there, of course, modern OpenGL, like any version, core profiles, those are fully supported. So make no mistake, that's all there. And uh, finally, when it comes to the utility functions, so the old QGL classes had a lot of uh, you know, various helpers like bind texture and, and so on. So these are gone. The good news is that some of them have modern replacements, like this QOpenGL texture is a very good example. You know, just use those. Uh, yeah. So, a similar slide, like to what we had in the beginning. Instead of hello GL, we have hello GL2. And, you know, it uses the open GL widget. We actually updated all the decent examples in Qt 5.4 to use the modern things, so open GL widget, and uh, removed some of the old legacy fixed pipeline examples. This is what and this is one of the updated ones. And as you can see, there's a single visible native window, which is, you know, exactly what we want. It's, you know, Qt handles the compositing internally. So once you start adding that uh, OpenGL scene into various layouts, you reparent, resize things, it, 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 it will just work much smoother than, than QGL widget did without all those glitches you had in the past. Now, since we are talking about QOpenGL widget, there's a good chance that you want to animate. And, uh, well, it's, 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 it's time to, again, talk about some new things, namely the swap intervals. So on the top there, you see a typical line from the past Qt examples, OpenGL examples, that yeah, we start like a timer, we say 60 milliseconds, and then we just, we just call update GL on the QGL widget. So why is this a bit, uh, uh, why is this less than ideal? Well, of course, for one, we don't have update GL anymore, which is of course obvious since it's the open GL widget, we only have update like for any other widget, but that's not the real issue here. The real issue is that since Qt 5.3, I think, pretty much all of our platforms will default to a swap interval of one, namely that the vsync will be enabled. So, let's see this in action. Ooh, okay, so two open GR digits. You know, here, now I have Let's change that interval. 
So I have used a timer. It's connected to the update function of the QPNG widget. Okay, it's all fine. You know, nice, nice big interval. Of course, it's slow. But of course, once you start below 60, like 10, 5, 1, whatever, you know, it doesn't, the, the frame rate that doesn't change anymore since, you know, due, due to the vsync, my thread gets throttled. So, of course, I can try render faster, but sooner or later, the graphics stack will block somewhere during the swapping of the buffers. So, when swapping the front and the back buffers, since we do double buffering. And, you know, this makes this, like using a timer of, say, 10 milliseconds, it's a bit useless because you could just get rid of the timer. So, now I'm just calling update from straight from PaintGL. And, you know, it still works the same way without the timer. You know, because my thread gets throttled when it's necessary. So, uh, really, so the recommendation is that here, that just think, so instead of, you know, like, copy-pasting these lines from old examples, just keep in mind that, you know, the vsync is likely enabled starting from Q53. So you can rely on it, and probably you should. Of course, you can, like this set swap interval into surface format is a new API in 5.3. So you can disable all this, like set zero, and then, you know, all this blocking magic is gone. But, you know, it might not be the most ideal solution. And of course, uh, I need to point out that uh, you know, timers with small intervals, say like one to five milliseconds, those have their uses. Even Cute, Cute Quick does that internally in some cases, you know, to give some time to the event loop. You know, if you think of there are a large number of incoming events, that's, you know, we just give some time to get all those processed. Still, just, you know, know what you are doing if you are using timers. And then in, in 5.4, we, you know, didn't leave the surface format behind. It again has a new addition, the set default format. This is a static function, and probably it's a great relief to those of you who are doing, you know, desktop applications using modern OpenGL, like relying on core profiles and whatnot, that you can now set request the OpenGL version once in the beginning of the application, so right in your main function, and then forget about it, because every context, window, widget, quick window, quick widget, everything, will use that format. Well, of course, unless you set a format explicitly for that instance, but for those you don't, you know, this is the format they will use. So, you know, just be aware that it's there and use it because it just really reduces the amount of code you need to write. And then, uh, this is of course handy, like if you use multiple contexts, you know, to set the format once for all of those. And this becomes really interesting if you consider the fact that with the new compositing architecture there are uh, many more contexts there. So there are a bunch of them, well, which you don't know about because they're internal to Qt. Uh, and, you know, these have quite a lot of consequences when you think of sharing of OpenGL resources like textures between, you know, windows, OpenGL widgets, and so on. Uh, yep, it's also a good time to point out that, uh, you know, QOpenGL widget is, uh, comes with quite a lot of documentation, and it's good. Well, I wrote most of it. Well, it's not good because of that, but anyway. Still, you know, all of these things I'm mentioning here, those are hopefully described there, so, you know, just use it. So, what's that? So, imagine the case that we have two windows, you know, 
one on the left, one on the right. And then in each of those windows, we have two, like, say, Q OpenGL widgets. Like uh, this contacts one, two, three, four. Like those are four Q OpenGL widgets. Now, these, of course, will have their own contexts. You know, that's beautiful. Q creates a context for you. It's fine. But to do the compositing, we will have an extra context for each window. You know, that's the context used internally by Qt when it performs this, you know, blitting and blending of the content. And why is this relevant to you? It's because this means that Q OpenGL widgets in the same window, like say this one on the left, will implicitly, you know, the context will share with each other, so they will see each other's resources, like texture created in widget one will be usable in, in widget two without any additional steps. So in QGL widget, if you remember, you had to do this manually to set up this share hierarchy by passing the uh, QGL widgets to each other, to the constructor and so on. So this is gone. You know, this will just work implicitly. Of course, the problem is still there, that what do you do if you want to access, say, a texture, a program, vertex buffer object from created in widget 1, and you want to access it in widget 3? Well, that won't work by default, right? Since, you know, those contexts are not sharing. And another thing, if you start reparenting these widgets, so say, move widget 1, uh, puts it to this other window, then you will lose the context since we need to drop it and recreate it to get the sharing properly working. Since now we need to share with this top level window context too and not the other one, which can be very annoying since this means that you will need to reinitialize your GL resources. Now, there's of course a solution to this. In Qt 5.4, we have this new application attribute called share open GL context, which will, you know, under the hood, by creating an extra context, make sure that, you know, all these contexts share with each other. So once this attribute is set, resources like textures will be visible, usable in all four open GL widgets. And uh, the restriction I just mentioned that parenting or moving things around between windows, that does not apply anymore. So then you are free to do what you want. Of course, obviously it has some, some, some drawbacks, like if you think that destroying an OpenGL widget will destroy the context and that will destroy all the GL resources without you having to do that manually, well, then you are wrong. So, you know, that's not really the case. So, really, go explicit. You know, like destroy textures and things like that explicitly. And finally, one common or popular question is what about the, this, this high DPI, retina screens? So, like click widget, OpenGL widget will work just fine out of the box. But if you, like you want to, you know, use different viewports or you are creating frame buffer objects yourself, which are somehow tied to the window size, then you need to keep in mind this device pixel ratio thing, because the window size may not be in pixel dimensions. That's whatever the windowing system gives you. So internally, like you open GI widget does exactly this. But if you are creating additional FBOs manually, then, you know, it's up to you. Similarly, screen changes, like moving a window from a retina screen to a non-retina screen and vice versa. So, yes, it's handled automatically by Qt. Except that, again, for your own resources, like own FBOs, you need to be careful because you might need to recreate that FBO. You know, there are signals or events you know, which notify you when, when, when this is necessary. 
so it's not complicated at all. And then we are done these widgets. So we finished quick, finished widgets, and now back to Q window. And this is really simple because here, you know, we see a typical example of doing some custom OpenGL stuff using a Q window. You know, you need to create your own context, manage when it's current, manage the buffer swaps, and so on, on your own, and take care of expose events and whatnot. So this is, of course, very powerful because you can do what you want. Qt doesn't get in the way. You know, you want to do all sorts of multi-threaded magic. It's all possible. But obviously, this is, you know, not always easy and convenient. So it would be good probably to have an easier way to get started. And so you have this. That's the OpenGL window. You know, it's, that's what you expect. It's a Q window. You inherit from it, just like you do with the OpenGL widget. And it has a familiar naming pattern of initialize GL, decide GL, paint GL. You can open a painter on it. You know, with QWindow, you can't open a painter. You need to use this external or additional or well, key open GI paint device or something to, to get a painter for a QWindow. Here, it's, you know, just easier. And it has an update function just to, you know, just like widgets. Everything I said about animation applies. So, for example, here we'll just call update. It's asynchronous from PaintGL. Of course, this means that we schedule the next frame. We rely on vSync, and so we will just continuously have PaintGL called at a smooth and steady, you know, 60 FPS or similar rate. Yes, and that was it, because there's not well, of course, Studio OpenGL window has some extra features, like you can uh, have an extra frame buffer. You know, this is inspired by QOpenGL widget, I mean, you know, that's backed by a frame buffer object. So whenever PaintGL is called, the previous content is preserved. So you can actually do this also with the OpenGL window if you want. But of course, it's optional, because by default, it's, it's like a real native window like using a window surface, which is, of course, still probably the fastest way. And then Duraster window. Well, I have nothing to say about this. This is there to complete, really, the offering, since if we have OpenGL window, why not have raster window? So this class is available even without OpenGL. This is the exact opposite. This is raster, software rendered. So the only thing you can do is to open a QPainter on it and perform some, you know, drawing, which is then done on the CPU. Except that, of course, if you have an embedded device where, for example, where, like 2D blitz could potentially be accelerated, let's like, say you are using DirectFB or something, then, of course, this can suddenly be very helpful because still you get some accelerated uh, drawing without OpenGL. So, yeah, there could be some, I don't know, interesting use cases for this one too. So instead of PaintGL, it has paint event. I guess that's obvious. And it has update. And you can open a painter on it. And it's a Q window. That's that. So, it's time to summarize these things. So this beautiful table, you know, shows the recommendations. I guess there's no, there are no surprises there. So obviously, if you want a QQ application, you know, QML, then of course, still the first thing to choose is QQ View Bell or QQ Window or QQ ML application engine, something, because that's still the best performing and, you know, that's the best way. Of course, if you know, you want the same thing, but combined with widgets, like say you absolutely want Q push button, then of course, you know, you use Q quick widget. But you don't choose Q quick widget just because, yeah, of course, you need to have a reason. So that's really for combining widgets and quick. When doing raw 
you know, real quick stuff, then yeah, go for QuickFit view. Well, again, uh, for OpenGL, I guess the choice is obvious. So if you don't care about widgets, it's OpenGL window. If you need to use other widgets, which is probably a common case, then you use your OpenGL widget. You never use QGL, whatever. No, it's QOpenGL. And of course, finally, we have QRaster window, which has a need for it. And of course, the really exciting Q quick render control part. You could use it in many ways, like in combination with OpenGL window, you know, doing your own renderer, and then, you know, do something with the generated quick content. And uh, as you heard earlier today, q 4 has a lot more exciting things besides these. So, yeah, there will be no time to talk about those today. So one of them is obviously the uh, adoption of existing native contexts, which is, you know, again, can be very useful in combination with quick render control, if you think about it, that you can now adopt like an existing GLX or EGL context from another engine, and then, you know, create a context that shares with that and then use the texture generated from Qt's in Qt's context in your external engine's context. And of course, a big, a really big thing will be this dynamic OpenGL implementation loading on Windows, which will e really make it, make your life easy when it comes to deployment for applications that use like the OpenGL widget, quick widget, so applications that use OpenGL in any way. So, yeah, if you are really interested in that, you can find me after the session. I'll probably be downstairs at your booth. So, yeah, we can talk about that if you want. So, thank you very much. Questions? Okay, thank you very much for this talk. Laszlo, uh, we now have something between 10 and 15 minutes left for questions. This will means you ask a question, I will hand over the microphone to you and Laszlo will answer it. So, are there any questions? Please raise your hands. There's one. Um, one question, on one of your slides you had a, a dialogue with 10 uh, OpenGL windows. Oh, yeah. um, is there a limitation? Um, could I have, uh, say, a hundred of those, like thumbnails of uh, some views? Will this cause problems or is this possible? Yes, so the question is about, you know, having like multiple like OpenGL widgets you know, that is there a limitation on the number of them. And, uh, well, of course, it depends what your machine or device can handle. So, like, you know, there's no limitation. So, really, the nice thing here is that it will work beautifully. So, with QGI widget, I know this was not the case, but here, you, you know, having multiple like 10, 20 QOpenGL widget in one window, that will just work because, you know, composition is handled by Qt and there, there will be one single swap in the end. So, you know, you get the proper 60 FPS, the proper animation for all of those. So, yeah, there's no limit there, but of course you will sooner or later hit, you know, some limitations, so things will start to slow down. So it depends on your system, really. Okay, so do, um, is it as, um, a single OpenGL context, this global context in the end, and the other ones are all virtual? No, no, no. Um, so, of course, uh, so it's a question about the contexts that, uh, and no, so each of these, like on that screenshot, so each of those two OpenGL widgets have their own context, of course, since we can't let the state be 
you know, messed up by the others. But of course, there are there's an additional context for the window, for the top level window. And then, of course, if you enable the global context, then there's another one. So then you have like 12. Thank you. Two more questions. One quick question. Uh, what is the reason behind the original implementation? I mean, like QGL window, you said that it opens multiple native windows and then draws upon each of them overlappingly. Why didn't, uh, why doesn't the original implementation already just handle the drawing off screen? Was there a performance reason for that or why? Well, yeah, so the question is about the, that why didn't we do this comp like compositing approach right from the start, like also for QGL widget? Well, that's, uh, yeah, so back then, I'm not even sure when, you know, QGL widget was introduced quite a long time ago. You know, of course, obviously the performance was not there. And, you know, still what QGL widget does, of course, that's still probably the most, uh, you know, obvious or most <laughs> generic way to get started. So that's simply, you know, historically it's been done like that. It's it, it's really today that now we see that, you know, this compositing, I mean, everything does that. So, you know, like frame buffer objects, things like that, those are usable and they perform properly. So yeah, that's that. I guess it wasn't working that well in the past. Okay, so, thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks. I, uh, I have a specific question about the uh, Q uh, quick render control. And uh, my question is whether it's possible to uh, set the device pixel ratio. Basically, I have a specific use case um, where I generate an image on a uh, retina display and then uh, uh, we have to pipe it, uh, pipe it off to a uh, device which has a uh, normal resolution, I mean, a, I would say a device pixel ratio of one. So is there a way to uh, set this uh, device pixel ratio at the start so that we don't generate an image that's too big for uh, our uh, for, for our purpose? Um, yeah, yeah, so that's pretty much total specific. So the question is about the device pixel ratio and uh, can be, you know, like, like disable that instead of two using the retina mode, can we change it to, you know, something else, so to the non-retina mode. So, well, yeah, so one option is obviously that's a platform plugin for Coco that has an environment variable which you could set, which then forces, you know, disables the retina mode, which of course I'm not really sure if that's what you want or not. So that's one option. Of course, the other option is still that, you know, you render at the double resolution and then, you know, you get a texture or something, of course you can downscale it or do whatever you want with it. So it's, you know, there are, it, it can be done in different ways. It really depends on your exact use case. Yeah. Yeah, I got my answer. Hey, uh, do you have any plans on enabling Core OpenGL context uh, in Q OpenGL widget in the nearest future? Uh, and uh, what is the main reason why you can't do it now? Is it related to QPaint or limitations? Uh, yes, so the question is about core profile context, that why don't we have that as the default? Well, uh, no, so that's not the only reason. I mean, obviously, li like the, the, the limitations of the paint and, uh, painter, but you painter backend, that's one thing. But uh, still, like, I mean, this applies to desktop, right? 
So still, if you think of the other devices like mobile or embedded, of course, they will not have anything like core profiles that they will have open GLEs. So still, we think that the same way to, to have as the default is like OpenGL2, because that's still like the baseline for everything. And then, of course, applications, the developer can, can choose whatever he or she wants, but you know, the, the default should be something that works out of the box, uh, you know, on the widest possible range of uh, target systems. So, yeah, so I guess that's probably going to remain that way. So I don't expect any changes in the future. Thank you. Um, say I have an external renderer written in just OpenGL, and I want to overlay this with uh, Qt widgets. Can I just um, draw this into a back into a frame buffer and give this to uh, QPQ? Or will this cause problems if uh, maybe an angle implementation is used by Qt, for example? Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question completely, but uh, yeah, I guess we can discuss that afterwards if you have some specific use case in mind. Okay, one more question in the back. Um, I had a question related to vertical sync. Um, I would expect uh, animation computations to be much, uh, to use less CPU because basically you only have to take once for each frame. But I have cases where uh, actually running an, an animation consumes a lot of CPU, although uh, it's limited to 60 frames per second. So I've been trying to investigate that. Uh, it's on uh, Mac OS using the Cocoa uh, plugin. Um, do you, are you aware of uh, issues that may ri uh, arise because uh, of some platform specifics or anything like that? Uh, well, not not right now. So I'm not really aware of any, for example, cocoa specifics there. So yeah, we can discuss it afterwards, but. Again, this is probably something the application has to deal with if you if, if it really has to do such heavy uh, computations for each frame. So, yeah, then of course this uh, naive or simple approach of just relying on the you think you know that might not be the best or might not work out. So, of course, it's it won't be suitable for everyone. Okay, any further questions? Last chance. I knew it. Um, so if you are writing an embedded, or if you have an embedded platform and you're concerned about A, uh, memory requirements of additional frame buffer objects, and B, uh, time of the uh, time it takes to composite, mm -hmm. um, are you still supporting this kind of um, native widget that renders to a platform frame buffer directly and is composited, uh, for example, by Kubernetes subsurfaces or different means? Yeah, so the question is about what about if there's limited memory like on an embedded device that, uh, you know, how well do we support those or are there some alternative methods for really doing that? Uh, path of, of composition. So, no, so currently there is a single path. So, you know, we will require, like, you know, that, that FBO for each open GL widget and then the composite using regular GL. Uh, well, so uh, uh, if when it comes to, you know, like low, really low end devices, you know, with limited memory, then you know, there's a good chance that also the 
performance, like OpenGL performance, is, is, is limited. So then I would, you know, consider looking at some alternative solutions. So for example, just today at the keynote, we heard something about, uh, you know, having Qtwick rendered in software, which is really exactly targeting the low end embedded segment. So if, if this really becomes a problem, then, you know, then, 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 then you need to look into some alternative solutions because then, you know, using regular OpenGL will probably be a problem anyhow. 